And I think it's true of everybody today in the world, and it doesn't matter who you are. As many of you know, I was at Camp Wingman this last week, and you all think I was on a vacation just kayaking and swimming with the kids and all of that kind of thing. But it's amazing what these third, fourth, and fifth graders have in their lives. You see, this sermon is really about, and this topic is really about despair and the things that are in our lives that we need to come to Jesus about. And you wouldn't think that third, fourth, and fifth graders would have that kind of thing, would you? You would think that they're just full of happiness and that. But yet, the weight of the world still rests upon them. The weight of the world is there. They still have these cares and insecurities but it's us who help to lead them. I think they're a great example of what the church should be and what maybe as adults we have lost in that. When we got there, there was this young girl and it was probably the second day of camp. And all she wanted to do was go home. It was her first time at camp. It was her first time being really away from her mom and dad for that long. It wasn't just a sleepover. This was going to be a week. She's just a little tiny little girl like this. And her counselor came up to me and said, Father Dave, would you talk to her? And so I went out with her and her counselor. And we stood outside the chapel during that time. And I talked with her and I said, do you realize? She goes, I just, I miss my mom and my dad so much. I just want to go home. And I said, you know, this is a gift that your mom and dad have given you. It's a gift that you can come to camp. Why? Because they love you. It's a gift to be received. And they wanted you to have this. And then we talked about a a couple other things and how much joy she would have at the end. And by the end of the week, while she was ready to go home, she wasn't. And on the last night I asked her, did you have fun at camp? And she says, yes. And I said, are you glad you stayed? And she said, yes. I mean, she got to kayak. She got to go out on... Um, they actually had a, a tube that somebody donated a boat. And she, if she wanted to go out on that, she could swim. She did archery. She's, I mean, a whole bunch of things. But the most important thing was she bonded with the other kids in her cabin. And it didn't matter what walk of life they came from because some of them came from very poor circumstances. Some from, came from very affluent circumstances. And yet they all came together. And it didn't matter. They became the church. And they cared for each other. There's another one that the counselor came up to me and said, Would you talk to this one? She cries every night. Not because she was wanting to go home, but because her family was split up. Her mom and dad were going through a divorce. They'd been at each other's throats for two years. They had separated. And her heart was, she wanted her mommy and daddy to be together. And so I talked with her and told her about what happened in my life when my parents divorced. And the thing was, is that my mom was 2,000 miles away and from where my dad was. And I couldn't see both of them. But she was blessed that she got to see both of them. And I said, it's not, I reminded her, it's not her fault that her parents loved her. And the best gift she could give to her parents was just to love them. And let them know that she loves them. And after that time, her heart was settled in peace. You see, these are two examples of kids today that are going through some sort of despair. Isn't it true? I mean, we may not realize it, and it may happen in their lives. It happens in our lives all the time. Don't we go through despair? How many of you have ever been in a disparaging situation? Whether it's health, whether it's finances, whether it's relationships... We all go through those times of despair. We all go through those times in which, oh, if only. 
And we want that resolution and in our lives. Our gospel is about two different people from two different walks of life who are in despair. They have no way of resolving the issue themselves. Jesus had just come across the Sea of Galilee again. I don't know if he gets frequent boater miles or not. I mean, he's going back and forth and back and forth. But he comes back from this area called the Decropolis. It was the ten fortified cities of Rome. And he'd been over there and he'd been ministering over there to the Jewish people who were really under a lot of Roman influence. He was in territory where there was a lot of Gentiles. And now he comes back over to Galilee where there's a very large Jewish population. And as he arrives at the shore, people know that he's coming there. He's like, I want to be there. The crowds wanted to be there. They wanted to see Jesus. They'd heard about Jesus. They wanted to hear his teachings. They wanted to hear that they had hope in their lives. They wanted to hear about what God was doing in their lives. They wanted to hear about what God was doing permanently. And so they crowd around. They see Jesus coming. He's like, well, today it would be like a celebrity coming into town. And what do people do if a celebrity comes to town? What do you do if a performer or some celebrity is out there giving autographs? It's not like one or two people are there, right? Mm -mm. What do they do? They're there. They're surrounding him. They're gathered around him. This is what happens when Jesus goes to some place. They hear about his miracles. They hear about what he's doing. They hear about what he's teaching. And they gather around him. And here comes this guy named Jarius. Now, Jarius is a very respectful person. He's a leader of a synagogue. And I guarantee you that at this time, normally, he would not really want anything to do with Jesus. Because he would have disrupted the way of the synagogue. He would have disrupted the way of teaching. And Jesus saying that, you know, he was the son of man. He was going to be, you know, the Messiah. It would have disrupted politically. And he just wanted to avoid it. But he's in a situation of despair in which he can't. Because you all know when somebody that you love very dearly is in a situation, what are you going to do? You're going to do everything you can to help them, aren't you? You're going to be right there with them. You're going to find every feasible way to be with them and support them. I remember when I was a single parent and I was outside and Daniel had some of his friends in the house and they were playing and I'm like okay fine just behave yourselves right well 10 year old boys are 10 year old boys you know where this is going don't you (laughs) so he and one of his friends actually his name was Rowdy but he and, and Griff and Rowdy were in the house playing and they decided that they were going to launch each other off of their feet. So one would lay down on his back, put his legs back. The other person would sit on him. The other one would be like the sawhorse to get over. And they would launch each other off. And all of a sudden, Rowdy comes out. He says, Mr. Dave, Mr. Dave, come quick. I'm like, oh, now what? What'd they break? It wasn't what they broke. It's what Daniel broke. He broke his arm. He landed wrong. I didn't come in and go, all right, what a bunch of dummies you are. What's the first thing I did? I said, Rowdy, Griff, go home. I grabbed Daniel. I threw him in the car. I didn't throw him. I put him in the car. And I take him down to the emergency room. Now, I got chastised for transporting him. They said, you should have called 911 because you're upset. Maybe you get in an accident. It didn't matter to me. I needed to get him there to the emergency room to get his arm fixed. And you know what my heart was going through at this time? This is what Jarius is doing. His little girl is dying. And he comes before him. He's a man of integrity, a man whose whose statue is high. And what does he do? He comes and falls at the feet of Jesus. And he begs. All of his pride went out. All of he didn't care what people thought about him. This is his little girl. 
and nobody could do anything to help her, but he had to have faith that Jesus could. And he comes to Jesus. And anything that was preventing him from even coming to him before, anything of his stature, he just dismissed. And you have to think about what the people around him... Look, there's the man of integrity. There's the mayor of the city. There's the president. There's whoever. And he's on his knees begging for his little girl. He comes before Jesus. And he begs him to come. And Jesus says, I'll come with you. Imagine what that crowd must have been like. They hear Jesus saying, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to see what he does. I'm going to see what he does. Jairus' daughter is dying. What's going to happen? The crowd's going to go, just nothing else, out of curiosity, aren't they? Let's go see what's happening. Come on, y'all been followers like that. Come on, there's once in your life at least you've seen something going on. You go, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go see what's happening. I go, come on. doesn't matter how old you are, it's true. Got to see what's happening. That happened a lot at camp, by the way. But you got to see what's happening. They're following Jesus. And then Mark tells us about this woman who comes. She's not of great stature. In fact, she's an outcast in her community because during those times, if they had a disease like she did and hemorrhaging, she would have been an outcast. She couldn't have come over to your house for dinner. Not that you'd invite her, but she might. She couldn't be a part of the community. She couldn't even socialize with the community. She would be an outcast because of the disease that she had. And I know that many of you, no matter what would happen, if you had something wrong with you, you would do everything in your power and go to every doctor that you could to try and get it fixed. But it was to no avail. There was no cure that they knew of. And where was her only hope? Her only hope was in Jesus. She had heard about the power that He had. She heard about the miracles. She heard about who He was. This was her last resort. She said, If only, if only I can touch his garment, if only I can touch his cloak, if only I can touch just the fringes, I know I'll be healed. Her going through that crowd, if she had touched anybody, they would have been defiled and had to be ceremonially clean. Imagine what would happen if people found out that she had touched them. They'd be upset and mad at her. But she reaches out and touches his cloak and immediately feels that healing power. And Jesus feels that power touching her. And surrounded by people, crowded by people. I'm not one who likes crowds, I'll tell you that. I want my space. But imagine what it must have been like that everybody was surrounding him. Jarius was there and he stops. He said, who touched my cloak? And rather than running off, rather than hiding... She comes, she kneels before him and tells him the story. And tells him the story of what had happened and probably went into a long literation or maybe not a long literation of how she'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years, how she'd been an outcast. All this time I can see Jerry is going, uh, Jesus, uh, we got a, an appointment up here. Let's go, let's go, let's go. I would be doing that. Come on, come on. But Jesus realizes the faith that she has. And she says, go, your faith has healed you. Peace be with you. In other words, there's no separation from God. There's no anything else. Your faith has healed you. And as they start on towards Jairus' house... His servants come and said, 
sorry too late those must have been devastating words to Jairus right on the threshold of having Jesus come to his house and we get delayed and now what can you imagine how devastating it was to him sometimes it's devastating to us when Lord where are you but he says two things don't fear don't fear only believe and they get to Jairus' house and there's a commotion and there's wailing because in those days they would have started the wailing process for somebody who has died and he goes she's not dead he's only sleep- she's only sleeping and for them they would have just laughed and they did really Jesus she's dead what are you going to do she's only sleeping he takes Peter, James and John he takes mom and dad with him reaches down touches her hand tell us the coom little girl rise up get up and she gets up and it's important to know that she's 12 years old she still has her life in front of her it's a time in which they can be betrothed not that they're going to get married but they can be betrothed to somebody imagine the joy in the, the family knowing that they have their little girl back a life to come a life to live a joy you see two people from two different walks of life have come to Jesus and they come to Jesus knowing that he is the one who is the healer and he's the one who can relieve them of despair it doesn't mean that every time we're in despair that it's going to turn out the way that we want I remember when I was with my mom during the last days of her life and praying and when she reached out her hand and I reached out and touched hers and she asked is it going to be alright I said yes mom your body's just doing what it needs to do and she had peace that she was going to be with the Lord and then when my sister called me and I ran back over there I won't tell you how fast I went the 160 miles to get there it was in record time and doing the last rites and knowing that she had gone she had hope to the very end that she would be healed but the hope that she had at the end was being with the Lord and the solace that we had was knowing that she was you see despair doesn't always end the way that we want it to end but we can always count on Jesus we can always count on God to carry us through in all those times of trouble and it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor fat, skinny, tall, short bald or not I'm working on it (laughs) doesn't matter because Jesus sees us and he sees our heart and he sees our faith in him that's what matters that's what he seeks from us do you have that faith to come So what are some of the things that we can take home with us today? And I think about today too because we are going to the source today where we're going to feed the homeless and how many times will we look at one of those homeless people and see how dirty and grungy they are and yet Jesus reaches out and says when I was hungry you fed me when I was poor you clothed me when I was thirsty you gave me something to drink Jesus always reaches out to us in our time in our time of despair in our time of joy weeping as our psalm said may last for a night but what happens in the morning joy comes in the morning he 
he turned my wailing to dancing. Because we know that Christ is with us. We know Jesus is with us. He doesn't look at our corruptness. He looks at who we are and our heart towards him. He takes us for who we are and our love for him. The despair that we have we can leave at the foot of the cross knowing that he's involved in it and he'll carry us through it. Today, what are the things in your life that you need to leave at the cross? What are the things in your life that are affecting you that you don't know how to resolve? What are the things in your life that affect your relationship with Him? What are the things in your life that when you come before Him today, you can leave with Him knowing that He's going to be with you? God is a God who reaches out to you. The campers, their verse for the week was while we were yet, God loved us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's love for you is so great that wherever you're at in life, He reaches out to you. And he invites you to come and lay those cares upon him. Today is a day you can do that. You may be like Jarius. You may be like that woman feeling like an outcast. But God brings us in as a family. God brings us together as a family. Amen. Let us, kids, young kids, third, fourth, and fifth graders, coming and expressing their concerns, the joys that they have, the happiness, but also the concerns they have, and they can take them to the cross. One of the things that I think is very significant that we learn from them and we learn from our message today is that it didn't matter whether they came from a wealthy family, a poor family, whether they were tall, short, skinny, fat, whatever, athletic, non-athletic. Those kids exhibited what the church should be. First of all, they exhibited the unity that they had together and caring for each other, which I believe this church should be doing. And reaching out to others outside. Caring for each other. And reaching to others and ministering to others and building the body of Christ. But you can't do it if you're not here. You're not the church. You're not doing what Jesus wants if you're not here. But also praying for each other in our time of need. And knowing in your heart that no matter where your walk is in life, that Jesus is reaching out to you to touch you, to carry you through everything in your life. No matter what that despair is, no matter what that joy is, He is there present with you and you don't need to wait until the time of despair to come to Him and experience His grace, His love, and His mercy. And when we come to Him and truly trust in Him, we can go forth into the world in peace. We can be of good courage. And we can hold fast that which is good. We can render no one evil for evil. And here's the great thing. We can strengthen the faint-hearted. We can support those who are weak. We can help those who are afflicted. And we can honor all persons. And why? Because we love and serve the Lord. And we can rejoice because we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us to do this. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. This week is the 4th of July.